Okay, so let's get started. My name is Joyce Raimondo and I'm here at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. And we are located in an area of the Hamptons called the Springs. And for many, many years, East Hampton and the surrounding areas have been a haven for artists. One reason is the spectacular nature, which I'll go over with you in a moment. We have a wonderful special guest with us today, Eric Dever. And Eric will talk about his art and um, weave in some aspects of his life and what inspires him. And our theme today is nature and art. So everybody, let's welcome Eric. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And Eric is today in the barn studio of Pollock and Krasna, and I'm sitting in the house, okay? So uh, I would like to just introduce the topic of the day uh, nature and art. And let me start by just taking a walk with you outside. It is quite windy, so I'm not going to be able to stay out there long. Um, and of course, this is the Pollock Krasna house. You can come back for a tour that's more focused on the history of the house. That was a replica of Guernica. Obviously, that's not an original, and it's not normally here. We have a, an exhibit, Picasso and Pollock today, okay? So I would like to show you the spectacular property. So Pollock and Krasner uh, came to the east end of Long Island in 1945 and later bought the house in 1946. And this is approximately an acre and a half of property and way in the distance there, that's a marshy area overlooking Akabana Creek. And that body of water would go all the way out. Eventually, those are inlets that would go all the way out to Montauk. And right there, there's actually a concrete platform that used to be where the famous barn studio was. And Pollock and his buddies moved it so as to not block the view. And I'll show you where it's located. So there it is in the distance. So that is where Eric will be zooming in from today, okay? And of course, today this property is a national landmark and you can really coming to the area, get a feel for not only the history, but also how the surrounding nature may have influenced and inspired these artists. So why did so many artists come to the East End? Well, obviously it's spectacularly beautiful. We're surrounded by water, by oceans and bays. So the light here is remarkable. It is so bright. The sky at times is so blue. And of course, of course artists always look for light. Light is color, right? Color is light. Um, but there's some other aspects that are very appealing for artists here, especially historically. Of course, moving from the city, many of these artists had a lot more space. So in Pollock and Krasna's house, they could use this room almost like a gallery space where they could display Pollock's art, have other artists and critics and dealers and so forth over. Lee was working in a small room upstairs and then later transferred to the barn. So there was also a thriving art community out here. Okay. Um, and also you can hop on a train and get right back to New York City, right? So uh, New York, Manhattan is about a hundred miles west of where we are right now. So there's many, many advantages for artists. And of course, in the forties when Pollock and Krasna came here, it was very affordable, right? They bought all this property, all this, house barn land for $5,000 and with a down payment from Peggy Guggenheim. Today, of course, the Bohemian artist is not uh, so much in the Hamptons anymore because the real estate is so expensive. However, as we're gonna see today with Eric, um, it is still a thriving art community. And I just feel so fortunate uh, 
to have someone like Eric sharing his work directly with us today. So I just want to show you very briefly on a PowerPoint, a little history of how these artists responded to nature on the East End. Then we'll bring it up to date with Eric. As early as the 1800s, artists assembled in the Hamptons, most famous being the landscape uh, painter Thomas Moran. And today, Thomas Moran's house is also a landmark in East Hampton and open to the public. So here's a view of East Hampton by Moran. And you'll notice uh, the colors are darker than the subsequent images I'm going to show you. Yeah, you don't, of course, Thomas Moran is looking at the scene and he's improvising. He's not painting it exactly, but you don't see as much of the artist mark, right? You don't see the painterliness, the brush stroke and so on. It's, it's smoothed out, it's, it's somewhat disguised. In fact, um, in the 1800s, artists like Thomas Cole and the American landscape painters considered it very egotistical to show the artist mark. It was actually, related to a um, moral principle. So later, um, artists such as Winslow Homer and others, they come out and you start to see it's more of a, a moment in time is captured, right? Where here's the East Hampton Beach, you start to see a more painterly aspect, you start to see movement. So you see, for example, the woman seems to be holding her hat and implies wind. She's in the middle of walking. It's a leisure scene. And it's as if we're there, right? And it's in plain air. This is leading up to impressionism. So now, of course, this is very common, this idea that artists go out into nature and they paint. But at that time, it was actually new and radical. The idea of painting scenes that weren't posed. And by the way, it's so interesting, the Long Island Railroad actually hired Winslow Homer to, and William Merritt Chase to make posters to promote the idea of bringing people out to the Hamptons as a tourist destination. And they did a really good job, didn't they? Because <laughs> today, it certainly is a thriving <laughs> tourist destination. So Will, Will and Merritt Chase, again, you see he's capturing a moment, you see children at play. These paintings were also very saleable because people could take paintings like this back to the city to be reminded of their vacation. And also it had this idea that it's very uplifting and uh, spiritually elevating to be in nature as well, right? And that's something that's learned. It's actually not innate, it's a cultural idea. It's a cultural construct and art promotes that idea, okay? Now also in Impressionism, it's, it's this idea that you're not just painting the way the scene looks, you're also painting all the senses. So you might get a sense of dampness or the smell of the, the scent of the ocean or the sea, right? The feeling of the sand the feeling that the artist has when he or she is painting the scene. And um, this of course leads to the abstract expressionist artists who take this to a whole other level. Where painting, I'm gonna go a little faster, painting becomes really eliminating a view of nature and painting nature directly from within. So this is Joan Mitchell. I paint from remembered landscapes that I carry with me and remembered feelings of them, which of course become transformed. I would certainly never mirror nature. I would like more to paint what it leaves me with. So it's a very personal experience of nature. It doesn't have to be tied to observation, although it might be inspired by observation to different degrees. And of course, this leads to Pollock with his famous action painting, right? Where Pollock is painting his energy. He says, I am nature. I don't have to paint a view of nature because nature is within, right? Um, nature is energy and movement. Nature is life, isn't it? Okay. And of course, his famous drip paintings, which he is most known for, where he completely lets go of the image and actually doesn't even touch the canvas itself, right? He's painting in the space above the canvas, walking around it. 
and his energy is captured as the paint moves, right? And his movement itself is captured in the final result. And that's why he's called an action painter. Lee Krasner is also an action painter, married to Jackson Pollock. So here's an example of her uh, work. This is called Bald Eagle. And she was very noted for these collages where she would cut up former artworks, or in this case, cut up a Pollock drip painting, and then reassemble it to create a completely new composition and then paint back into it. So it's very, very bold. He's not painting a view of nature. Nature is within, it comes directly within her. Painting for me, when it really happens, is as miraculous as any natural phenomenon. And I think coincidentally, Eric and I chose the same quotes, right, Eric? So it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so this is a perfect segue to introduce Eric, who is a painter, um, and he lives in Watermill. And he also is currently the artist in residence at the Parish Art Museum. And he will tell us more about that. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for, for Zooming with us today. I'd like to thank um, Joyce Raimondo and, and Helen Harrison for inviting me to participate. And, um, and mentioning that I've enjoyed visiting the Paula Krasner Study Center for nearly three decades and encourage anyone visiting Eastern Long Island to make an appointment when it opens and experience this rare artist realm for, your, for yourselves. It's, it's very unique, nothing like it. Um, well, as you can see, I'm mentioning, um, I'm bringing up this, this quote again. I, I, I could bring to your attention as well, a terrific book on Jackson Pollock also by Helen Harrison. Um, the, um, I do not paint nature, I am nature, um, will be the cornerstone of this presentation. It, it also is a touchstone and a personal mantra. Lee Krasner's wisdom, painting for me when it really happens is as miraculous as any natural phenomena, encourages me to be bold in my own work and fearless when I feel stuck. This is also another biography by Gail Levin, which, which really presents the whole history of, of modernism in this country and abroad. Um, it, um, it's, it's unparalleled. One way that I like to think about the trajectory of my life as an artist is how it relates to geography, latitude and longitude. I was born and raised in Los Angeles near the 35th parallel, which is subtropical. Agapanthus or lily of the Nile flowers grew alongside our houses. Incidentally, Jackson Pollock and Philip Guston both attended Manual Arts High School near the city center. Aerospace and Hollywood were the chief industries at the time. And calla lilies grew alongside our driveway. Pictured above, my mother is wearing um, cymbidiums, which my grandmother prepared for special occasions. And I'm carrying um, a bouquet of calla lilies. This photo was taken by my father. By the 1960s, nearby airport expansion had taken a toll on its neighbors. The noise of the new jumbo jets was, was deafening and the air was filled with soot from giant engines. Families had to limit their time outdoors and some experienced respiratory difficulties. Finally, the city of Los Angeles purchased or condemned a number of properties. Pictured here is one of my neighbors poignantly waving at a passing jet in her front yard, which in my mind speaks to the resiliency of children. The bird of paradise plant and flowers are drought resistant and continue to grow in the area on traffic islands today. Pulitzer Prize winning author Elizabeth Strout wrote in her novel, My Name is Lucy Barton, that everyone has one story to tell. Through the lens of Citizen Kane, the bird of paradise 
would be my rosebud. Bird of paradise flowers follow the, the contour of the earth around the globe through North America, the Atlantic Ocean, Africa, the Mediterranean Sea, Asia, and the Pacific Ocean, as evidenced by photos, accounts, and international postage stamps. When I was 24, on Monday, August 16th, 1986, I boarded TWA flight 840, departing LAX at 8.30 a.m., arriving later that day in New York at JFK with a suitcase and my savings in my pocket. The balance of my art education and career has been spent just above and below the 40th parallel north, where darker skies, long shadows, a northeastern urban palette characterize a portion of the year. The AT&T building near St. Canal Street and 6th Avenue was a favorite in my new neighborhood. The painting title reflects the kind of building or architecture that Anne Rand was championing in her novel, The Fountainhead. Looking back, I realized that much of the darkness in my palette was not entirely from sampled color or atmospheric. I enjoyed spending time on rooftops and was fascinated by urban views. I worked at the New Museum of Contemporary Art on Broadway as a security guard opening and closing padlock security gates, doors, shutting off the alarm in the morning and setting it in the evening. But my trips to the Metropolitan Museum of Art felt like time travel. Their collections and presentations of humanity became the subject of my painting, an effort to tuck myself into time, forms and ideas that seemed to have prevailed. Fear and artistic sublimation were among my initial responses to the AIDS crisis, which became an epidemic and ultimately a pandemic. In March 1987, playwright and AIDS activist Larry Kramer established the AIDS Coalition to unleash power or act up, which became one of the most effective health activist groups in history. Playwright novelist Joe Pinturo wrote Raft of the Medusa. His characters reflected the diversity of the epidemic, including homosexuals, heterosexuals, bisexuals, conservatives, liberals, black, white, Hispanic, rich and poor alike. And this was performed in 1990. Bethesda Fountain in Central Park commemorates the 1842 opening of the Croton Aqueduct, which supplied New York City with fresh water. The sculpture and fountain, Angel of the Waters, was designed by Emma Stebbins and dedicated in 1873. Stebbins became the first woman to receive a commission for a major work of art in the city of New York. She linked the pure city water flowing from the fountain to the healing powers of the biblical pool. My version is a mixed media painting on burlap. Fallen leaves and sticks pressed into wet plaster gripped the saturated warp and woof of sized burlap. An all over coat of amber shellac scraped down in places reveals white plaster. Stapled tar, tar paper and a piece of branch rest in the dark hued pool. The figure, the figure was preparing to depart and proudly. I completed the painting in 1987 in time for my NYU graduate exhibition at 80 Washington Square Galleries East in the spring of 1988. Playwright Tony Kushner understood the symbolism of the curative powers of the water from the biblical fountain of Bethesda and appropriately set the final scene of the perestroika section of the AIDS theme play Angels in America at this location in Central Park in 1993. I began visiting Eastern Long Island after graduation and moved there full time in 2002. This is where I began a 10 year long project painting ex exclusively with white, black, and then red. Beginning with white, a non objective investigation unfolds into the materials and methods of painting. 
and a highlight was exhibiting with the reductive painting group of artists at Paris Concrete in Paris. In 2013, oh, I'm so happy about this still. <laughs> I was offered representation by Christine Berry and Martha Campbell, a courageous and astute partnership forming Berry Campbell, a gallery in New York. Um, the introduction of black in my work revealed a subject, light and darkness. Yoga studies eventually led me to red and an inward journey exploring the qualities of light, energy and matter. Principles discussed in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita. Sources Pollock was also acquainted with himself through his interest in theosophy. In 2013, I began abstracting a rose from my garden, spanning 26 six by six foot canvases. Several were presented in my first exhibition at Barry Campbell in 2014 and traveled to the US Consulate General of Hong Kong and Macau in 2016. And I began working with increasing gesture, imprinting, pressing paint loaded surfaces onto the canvas. And I was particularly proud of being to be included in this exhibition at the parish, Parish Perspectives, um, new work. This was when my painting entered the collection, new works in context curated by Alicia Longwell in 2017. Okay. And as though breaking a long fast, for my second exhibition at Barry Campbell in 2019, I began working with the full color spectrum and a palette prepared with seven hues. Summer twilights are sometimes called the gloaming or l'air bleu. This blue hour is most represented in my painting when much of New York and the Northeast are in full bloom. There is an early pandemic, this is an early pandemic studio view paintings resulting from, from mindful walks, looking up and focusing on the blossoming tree canopy, a, a closer inspection of the unfolding spring palette itself. This outdoor exhibition on Long Island featured works installed on properties from Hampton Bays to Montauk with social isolation as just one theme. No one was supposed to get too close to each other over the weekend during a drive-by exhibition of works by 52 artists on the South Fork. A dose of culture amid the sterile isolation imposed by the pandemic. I had never really before considered exhibiting my paintings outdoors, but I mounted them on tomato stakes in front of my studio and greeted a parade of visitors, including the New York Times as they made their way up and down the highway. I, I was impressed by these kinds of adaptations which speak to human resourcefulness and resiliency. I continue to enjoy and find meeting presenting workshops, especially the creative studio at the parish and the continuing education the experience provides me. The discovery of imprinting or monotype techniques by Degas and the decalcomania of Max Ernst and Du Buffet inform much of my own painting. Um, and also note the, the poured ink in the foreground over Degas' oil imprinted paint surface. And alternately pastel over oil imprint on paper. In 2020, I completed a Warhol Foundation Nature Conservancy Montauk Project Artist Residency. The Warhol Reserve is located at the easternmost tip of Long Island. Paintings from this project highlight the palette of these seasonal blue northeastern summer hues again. I am not a plein air painter. I complete my work in the studio. But visiting the site, I was impressed by alternating sensations of heat, strong sunlight, and a cool ocean breeze. As the landscape is drained of sunlight, 
summer twilight takes over and a moment's glimpse of a seemingly impossible ocean palette. Midpoint through the project, having left the actual Warhol site and exploring Montaukett ancestral lands and vistas, I found myself taking cues from Warhol self-portrait, pairing complementary or opposite colors on coarse linen and burlap. The paintings at times resemble silkscreen. A reimagined view of Scallop Pond from Pullman Oak Path, dedicated to Montauk King, Stephen Tockhouse Farrow, is among my favorites. Note the use of GPS in the title here. Um, this became one of the ways I, I considered titling work as well. I think if one followed those stones the, or pathway, um, they would probably end up across the Atlantic and Portugal. And oh, here. By no coincidence, I feel drawn to the 36 views of Mount Fuji by the Japanese Yukioe artist Hokusai and his paintings of the natural world. Yukioe art is also influenced, has also influenced the impressionists to focus on the subject only and to eliminate excessive details and complicated backgrounds from their paintings. At NYU, I had spent time in Krishna Reddy's printmaking color atelier with Phil Payton, who taught the techniques and materials of traditional Japanese woodblock printing, mokohanga. Personally, I found it very difficult, cutting and preparing the wood surfaces and registration notches, but mixing the paints, grading paint and burnishing it onto surfaces is something that has stayed with me. It also gave the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists an understanding of the beauty of a flat appearance to artwork, including terrific atmospheric effects of graded ink and the negative space where we could see, I believe, the, the integrity of the rice paper itself. For the past two years, I've been reintroducing line and drawing back into my work. Note the occasional use of line between the similarly hued forms in Hokusai's under the wave of Kanagawa, also known as the gray wave or the wave. It was published sometime between 1829 and 1833 in the late Edo period as the first print in Hokusai's series, 36 views of Mount Fuji. This is the, the line that I'm speaking of here between the rice paper and, and uh, somewhat very light wash. Where, whereas this part of the wave here is just distinguished really by, by the blue form with, with, with no line. It's that, it's that use of line that I found useful. Hellebores are among the few flowers that bloom in the winter with blossoms under the snow. And it's happening now. I began this painting drawing with oil pastel on the linen, followed by sprayed paint um, on the surface, then more poured paint, working both back and forth with brush and knife. Here's a more chromatic version of the same subject. Tree canopy, more spring observations, though increasingly elegiac, are characteristic of my work following a second pandemic spring. Dogwood and lilac flowers bloom simultaneously. The line exists back and forth between drawing and painting. Summer storm or tipping point is a work in progress and it's informed by telephone conversations with West Coast family and friends struggling to breathe in the proximity of devastating fires and also our own eventual awareness of ash directly observable in the form of darkened skies last summer, an oddly crimson sun, poor air quality throughout the Northeast, and, and a glimmer of hope in the yuccas unique restorative or air purification capabilities. And then, and then a return to agapanthus 
further consideration of line and an evocative palette in a larger format. This painting is a large diptych in progress, exploring formal qualities and use of negative space as in Chinese and Japanese screen painting. As Joyce mentioned, I'm, I'm proud to participate as this year's Parish Art Museum 2022 artist resident. To date, we have worked safely with 252 students from various schools spanning fourth grade through high school, including life skills groups. The resulting mural in progress is currently being prepared with care by the museum and will span seven rows of 36 columns, totaling 54 feet long. This will be installed in one of the museum's center spines and unveiled on March 12th on view until May 1st. Everyone's invited to come. Please, please come and see us. I am reminded by this project how young people are also a true force of nature, including the power and directness of their own painting and drawing. We have a lot to learn from each other. As part of self-care during this time, a good place to start is to find the children we once were and have left behind. Let's make sure we give all young people a healthy, sustainable environment and the best opportunities possible. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that was breathtaking. And oh, thank you. Honestly, I can only imagine if the paintings and the colors look so beautiful on a computer screen, what they might look like in real life. Oh, thank you. So I hope to get to see the actual paintings. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have some comments coming in. So um, Lori Lambrick says, bravo. Oh, thank you. And wonderful journey. I'm mm -hmm. wondering, does anybody have any questions or would anyone want to add anything uh, to the discussion? Any comments? You can um, put your questions in the chat. And then I could also ask you to unmute, but because we have a big group first, put it in the chat, please, okay? Well, I have a question, Eric. Mm -hmm. and I hope other people do have some questions as well. But when I was looking at the diptych, that's 10 feet, that's pretty large. And some of the other later works are pretty fairly large. And I'm yeah. wondering what your process is um, do you do like smaller sketches? Do you actually observe the fl floral images in nature? Do you work from observation at all? Or is this, where does this, well, these compositions come from? Um, I, I often start with just really putting paint on the surface. And I'm able to do that through, through um, a, you know, a number of means. Sometimes I, I, I draw a little bit and, and then, Put a put maybe uh, pour some paint on it, and and this is this is a little bit more recent. Um, um, it's it's really from doing Zoom exercises with other people, and and I find myself taking, following some of my my own oh, advice to to others in 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 teaching formats, and so so I have been experimenting with with pouring the paint with with spraying it on with household um, used household con spray containers. And, and I like the line, how it gives me a scaffolding to work with. Um, but, but then I also, I really try to annihilate the whole thing as well with, with um, layers of color. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to build an experience and I'm using anything I can to do it. Wow, that's, that's, that's remarkable, honestly. So let's see, we have a couple of questions here. Hang on. Oh, wait, I have to, I don't know why this is showing up so small. Uh, wait, hang on. I'm sorry, I just need to get to these. I wanna make sure I get everybody. No, oh, sure. Hang on.
Okay. Um, well, uh, Jordan Baker Kilner says that they he uh, would love to see your work in the studio. Oh, nice. Thank you. Um, Marilyn Joseph says, again, it was a fabulous journey. Nicholas Hall says, so curious. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Nicholas. Will you unmute and just ask your question? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm curious to know more about you shared about, you know, working with white, like white for 10 years. I just cannot imagine <laughs> being that level of discipline to sort of stay within those guardrails. So I'm just, I'm curious to know maybe a little bit more about that journey, what you were hope, you know, what, what prompted it, what, how you finally gave yourself permission to, to veer off, you know, to veer from there. So just curious to understand more, more about that experience. Um, when I first came to Long Island, I, I had done some work with, with sampled color, but, but, um, um, I didn't want to become a facile painter. And so um, I began to, to really look back at and, and to reconsider um, the uh, methods and materials of painting. And, and I, I, took, I was interested in um, my mentor at NYU was Marsha Hafif, who was a monochrome painter. And, and part of her program had something to do with really just experiencing the whole the, the whole painting experience. Um, for I didn't stay. Ex, I stayed with White for about about um, four and a half, five years. But then I added Black, and so then there was another two years. But but the kind of the kind of desire to to work with um, um, another another hue was was becoming very strong and so I so and I had accomplished much of what I was interested in working with different supports different canvas linen burlap knives brushes and I you and and exploring the range between zinc white and titanium white and so when so I did test out some blacks but I arrived at at ivory black and I worked with that for about two years which suddenly brought content so I was no longer really a non-objective it was no longer a non-objective project, but it, but just by the introduction of black, suddenly there's this sense of light and dark, and what does that mean? And 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 the kind of content. When I added red, it 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 eventually, um, and I pretty much concluded the project with with uh, in ten years. But but red drove me fast into ex opening up my painting, expanding it quickly. And, and trying different different techniques and, and eventually finding my way into gesture, considering subject, which again, was very limited. It was a single flower, but, um, but explored in 26 iterations. The, um, um, and and I, I was wondering, well, what color do I use next? Did white, black, red? And, uh, and then I, I just decided um, time waits for no one just just do the color spectrum and work with that. But in so, um, I do mix every color that I need out of the color spectrum or the color wheel. I don't, I don't purchase um, raw umber or ochres. I mix everything and every kind of green, every kind of blue I need. And that comes from the rigor of working with a limited palette for so many years. Great, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Teresa Davis had a question about the uh, canvas. Teresa, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Unmute. Okay, what about Annalise Jervin? You had a question, would you like to unmute? Yes, hi. I think I'm unmuted. Um, my name is Annalisa Jensen, and I'm also out on the East End. So hi, and thank you for this very thorough presentation. Um, you went so deep into how you started um, your process and where you are now. And it's whether you're picking a color, your subject matter, going for a walk. It's very... Um, you're so invested in it. And so I'm wondering, 
Uh, is it difficult for you to combine if you're involving other people, let's say in a community project and then with your own sort of solitary painting, uh, how, how do they inform one another that process? Well, that's interesting. First of all, it's a welcome distraction to be involved in a project like that. But I also might say it's limited. And so it's for a duration. And and uh, um, and I engage with other people monthly, but usually not much more. Um, this project um, I had presented, I think, in 2015 on a, on a very um, limited workshop basis. It's called the Visual Conversation, and when and I was delighted when the and surprised when the parish asked me to to be artist resident, and they were, but they were very specific with their interest, and they wanted this visual conversation that was prepared for, for a high school that was visiting from Nassau County. They wanted it for their full constituency of over um, um, 300 people. Um, due to COVID, there's, we ended up with 252 peeps participants, which is, which is remarkable during that this took place during January, the end of December, January, and beginning of February, it was at all. And, and it was safe as well. Um, but uh, this was tackled um, one group at a time. And, and so they had access to the space, um, one group, one classroom at a time. You know, and, uh, the, and then the work will be assembled. Each of those groups will, will join each, uh, uh, each other, all the other groups. And then that will form the very large, the large mural. Thank you. Good question, Annalise. And uh, Kara A. Bourne, I don't uh -huh. know if your question was already answered, but would you like to ask a question or comment? Hi, Eric. That was great. Thanks, Kara. Um, I, I was asking about the color, too, and how you limited your palette at the beginning, and now you have always you use so many beautiful colors. And I think you answered my question, but does it come back to you now when you're painting with these colors? Do you remember? what it felt like to have a limited palette and does it make you appreciate color more or, or does it, has it changed how you feel or use color? Um, yes, it does. It, it, um, it's, it, uh, it, well, the best way I can describe this is to um, mention your painting, which is very similar in, it's a companion piece to the work that went to Hong Kong. And, and was also in Barry Campbell. And because the, um, what I learned is how to really eke out the most of, of each color. And it's really what the paint manufacturers do too. The, the, the components are all listed on the side, the chemicals. I'm not so interested in the chemistry of it, but for instance, when you mix, if, when you're, when you mix titanium white, this is a good example, which, runs, which, is, which is a blue that runs very white, and you're mixing it with naphthol scarlet, which is sort of a, a medium red, it's not too hot, might be a little on the bluish side too. And you're mixing that also with the percentage of ivory black, which is a cool black. It's possible to achieve the effect of a pale, a palish um, purple, a deep purple. And, and then when you combine it with with a color that's next to it, for instance, now we get into the realm of Joseph Albers and relative color theory, you're able to influence what the color you're working with um, is by, by what you put down next to it. So that's really the thing I learned from red, black, and white was that. But that also, um, these colors have kind of a, um, material qualities that, that signify principles um, um, in us. And, and so just like um, black might be is symbolic of matter and white being a kind of the, the ether sphere or lightness, red being energy, the, um, so does the spectrum. The spectrum as we know it in, in a rainbow, in, in our light, but, but um, to, to people who study Ayurveda, it course, these colors correspond exactly to the chakras, which, which red beginning at the base of the abdomen, and then um, orange, somewhere mid, mid 
abdomen and then um, yellow around the liver. The lungs to them are green. The voice is blue and higher consciousness or is, is purple and then then white, the ether sphere. I don't completely, I'm not working with that, but 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 they do have, but but this is thousands of years old, this correspondence, and it does mean things to many people. Thank you. Uh, would anyone, Teresa, let's see what Teresa Davis did have a question. Teresa, are you on? Do you want to unmute and ask the question? Can or you can, hear me, Joyce? We sure can. Teresa Davis is on the staff of the Paula Krasna House. And um, so thank ahead. you, Eric. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, I was so curious about your burlap. Do you use raw burlap? Um, I, um, I had been using early on um, at when I was at NYU, I used to go to visit a, a storied uh, art supply store, David Davis on Lafayette. And it was just, it was remarkable. It was like a cave, but with just wonderful art supplies. And, and so that's where I discovered it. And, and, uh, um, and at first I really, you know, I wasn't really preparing it much. And, uh, but then when I um, began working with the red, black and white project and living out here, it became, it became very necessary to prepare every surface correctly. And for that, I've been using a PVA size, which is kind of a glue like material in place of rabbit skin glue, mm -hmm. which is impervious to water Technically, you could throw a glass of red wine on and it would like bounce off, but mm. I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that's uh, um, but I, I, for the most part, I've discontinued it and I found a, I found some very heavy linens that I like working with that are thicker and more and denser. And so that's become my, one of my go-to surfaces. And you don't treat that? Yes, I do. I treat everything with the same with the oh. same PVA size, uh -huh. and I saturate it. Um, it changes the color slightly. It makes it slightly darker, but but to anyone looking at it, it still has that that sort of raw feeling. You still have that sense of surface. It's still and that texture. Do you still have that texture? It's still there. Uh -huh. It's it, it's just it's like it's like painting. It's kind of it's related to this. It's like painting your surface with will hold blue, mm. blue a little water, but, but mm -hmm. that's not archival. I don't think that's the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And then do you use oil paints? Is yes. Oil paints and a palette knife. Yeah. And brush uh -huh. and, and some, a little bit of squirt, not like Jackson Pollock, but, but, and I spray a little bit. Uh, um, and I, I use every, use everything I know. It, it's just beautiful. I am just inspired beyond belief. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have time for more. Uh, can I, more can I ask a Can oh, I ask a question? What is your name? Candice. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi Candice. How are you? <laughs> it was fabulous. Such a good presentation. Beautiful work, which, of course, I have loved before seeing this anyway. So um, I did want to ask you a question about the white series. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm interested in whether or not you were, um, you know, relating it to the Ry Robert Ryman's white uh, period. Well, I was aware of them and, and I certainly admired and continue to, to admire what he's done. But you know, what I've learned from this project, this community one, is that in the individual conversation, is that everyone, just as our voice, for better or worse, everybody has, has their, makes their own mark in their painting or their drawing. It's just, they, they, it's, they just have it. And so, so. Um, I was just, no, I was wondering yep. whether or not you, um, uh were working out of the same mindset that he, that he had you know that kind of um minimalist uh you know nothingness of buddhism and 
uh, or was it some other kind of principle that you were coming uh, at from that uh, white? Yeah, at that point, it certainly, um, I, I, I wasn't practicing yoga when I began this project. And so uh -huh. um, for me, it was really, at first it was just a way to really um, explore painting material methods and to understand more about painting. And it wasn't so much about color, the, at the beginning, the white itself, I was just looking at as that white as material. It was, it, it, it was colorless. And so it didn't, it had no meaning for me as white. Um, and, and, and then I began to compare and contrast the, the, the biggest difference I could eke out was one layer or two layers or zinc versus white or painting on canvas versus a dark surface. And, and the things I've learned from that, I still practice today. If I'm working on canvas, which is bright, it's much more reflective for certain, certain colors. If I'm working on linen, which is dark, it's beautiful in that it seems to absorb the color. It's very nice for shadows and things. And, and, then, and then again, alternately working with white, uh, I mean, sorry, working on a, on a canvas or a primed or unprimed, I tend, to, I tend to not use gesso, but I use the size. Um, so for me, canvas, it was largely material. It didn't, it didn't become a, it, it, it didn't enter into the yogic realm until I had began working with black and then was considering red. And then I understood, I, had, I was pursuing yoga, yoga, yoga studies. Yoga is not just a physical practice, it's, it's um, eight limbs and there's thought and study. And, and, uh, um, and I became aware of this principle called the gunas, which um, connect all life. And it's talked about in, in those sources I mentioned. Have you read that mustard seed book, the Chinese about Chinese painting, and the and how they deal with color? I have no. No. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll note that. Oh, I'll you. send it. I'll send it to you. But um, okay, thanks. Have you changed your mind at all about the way that you were looking at um, these single colors that you started out using? I mean, when you started out using them, you had one mindset. Have you changed your mind about how you were thinking? No, actually recently, and I haven't included this, but I did a series of, of paintings in ink and they were all monochrome. This was like uh, two years ago. I call it the last day of summer. It's just when everything clears up. And, uh, and so I, I began painting these um, painting with these um, inks and watercolors, and I and I and they were monochrome paintings largely because I didn't know anything about this ink or, or watercolor, liquid watercolor, or the colors themselves. And mm -hmm. so, so that was how I I um, was going through my cachet. I was learning about it was just working monochromatically, and so I still I find that valuable. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everybody, we are going to have to um, close. But before we do, of course, I want to thank so much. Thank you, Eric, for thank you. you really gave us a window, not only into the evolution of an artist, but also how methodical your process is. And okay. it was both informative and also really inspiring. And I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way and got so much out of it. So well, super thank you thanks. for asking me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Let's give Eric a round of a Zoom round of applause. And um, thank you, thank you. Thank you.